thanks for the folks who participated in the challenge and uh, for showing up to this workshop. It's been a lot of fun and it's been great to see uh, all the action of the teams. So today, this is the schedule for today. We're going to start with object detection. That's going to be a presentation from a selection of the teams uh, and then spotlight so you can see a little bit about some of the other methods. Uh, then classification and localization. And then this uh, awards discussion. And uh, there's a nice award from NVIDIA for a couple of the teams of fancy GPU workstations. Uh, and then at the end, there'll be posters and live demo sessions. And we'd like to uh, thank the sponsors again, <coughs> Google and our respective institutions, and the UNC, uh, the award sponsor, and uh, Cohen Band Center, who's contributed a lot to the various solutions for the challenge, and also uh, video and today's presentations. So why are we doing this? Right? Why did we start doing this challenge? We were looking at recognition problems, and at some point in time, people looking at recognition looked at relatively small data sets. So you might look at a handful of categories and try to distinguish between these categories. But something about the real difficulty of the problem is lost when you look at that scale. And when you actually look at large-scale recognition problems and try to discriminate things against the variety of things you might see in the open world or the more challenging recognition settings, you really need to start looking at large-scale recognition evaluation. And this is where ImageNet came in because you need benchmark data sets. You need someone you know, like Olga who's responsible for managing the labeling process to get the training data and the test data that you use for these large-scale evaluations. Um, of course, this comes after the, the history of the Pascal detection challenge. This was going on from 2005 to 2012 with uh, 20 categories labeled for object detection and later on some work on segmentation. Um, in contrast, ImageNet is now up to 200 classes fully labeled for object detection um, and has for, has for a while had a thousand object classes for image classification and localization of objects in this image. Uh, so we're talking about almost 500,000 fully labeled images for detection and over a million for classification. <coughs> One of the nice things you get out of large-scale labeled data sets is you can do evaluation of how techniques perform on different, you know, different scenarios where you're looking at distinctive shapes, large things in the real world like airplanes, uh, smaller. Uh, things that are distinctive for color, not distinctive for color, distinctive for texture, not distinctive for texture, whether they have a distinctive texture that shows you what it is. And being able to analyze these types of variations is something you get almost for free once you've labeled this scale of data. Uh, and there's a paper from ICCB, which I think is advertised at the bottom there, avocados to zucchinis, with some analysis. Um, there's a little bit about the relationship between the detection data set and the classification data set. So for detection, we collapse some of the categories to be more like entry-level categories. So you detect birds. In the classification and localization, you look at the subtypes of birds. Detect bottles versus subtypes of bottles. Um, one of the things we're really excited about is the increasing participation in the challenge over time. Uh, this is up through last year, 2013. So the prior three years, we had about as much participation as we did last year. And I think a lot of this was, you know, progress in, in detection. In uh, 2012, you had the Krzyzewski hinting result showing that you could get good features that were useful for classification and localization. And one of the things we're really excited about, and this is due to lots of hard work by lots of people, is participation this year is significantly higher. There's a lot of people working on, working on the challenge this year and showing off their techniques uh, with some really great performance. Uh, this year, in order to help people who were <coughs> who had questions about whether they could participate if they didn't want to reveal their technique, and this was sort of helpful for some of the industrial teams, uh, we offer teams an option to either submit an open submission where they promise to reveal their technique, or a closed submission where they might, they might hold their technique back. And it was really nice that almost all teams chose open, so 31 out of 36. And even two of those closed teams are going to come here and say something about what they did. So the self-participation a little bit, but people who are surprisingly open is really nice. So I'm going to go over a couple of the tasks. So
So the uh, image classification task is to say that in this image there is a steel drum. Uh, teams get to make several guesses, five guesses, as long as one of them is correct, you get steel drum right. Uh, if your output didn't include uh, steel drum, then you get this wrong. Uh, we look at a measure of the error on this, and we can look at how that error measure has decreased over time. This is, this is relatively nice. So you can see 2012 when Krzyzewski Hinton came out, we saw this, this major improvement in production in the error rate. We saw a smaller reduction last year, and then another big reduction in the error rate this year. This is really, really exciting progress <coughs> in the image classification version of this problem. Right. Uh, you can see a similar pattern for localization here. Right? It's not quite as big a drop. Um, and then one thing we're really excited about, so here we're looking at average precision for detection. So again, there was a huge jump from 2013 to 2014. So before 2013, we didn't have the fully labeled detection data. This is, this is exciting progress. And there is an in-depth report about this, which is already up on archive. This is from Olga and, and the rest of us. And this goes into a detailed description of how these data sets and labels were collected, highlights the most successful algorithms over the years, gives a statistical analysis of the results through this year. Right? So it includes analysis of what happened this year. And it, it has this, this neat new experiment comparing computer vision accuracy with human level accuracy. And with that, maybe Olga wants to say another word about that. Um, 37 page yes, archive slash drill Yep. All right. No, I don't actually have more to say about this. I think the coolest part is actually the human, um, human level accuracy compared to the computer vision accuracy, and we'll talk about that. So um, I think basically throughout, uh, I mean, in the next two slides and uh, at the beginning of the uh, 11 a.m. session, we'll talk a little bit about some of the parts of the paper, including the human level accuracy analysis. All right. But here we'll talk about the object detection tasks. So the theme of the first morning session is. So the data is fully annotated with 200 object classes across um, about 120,000 images. <coughs> so um, this allows for evaluation of generic object detection in very large scenes at large scale. So the evaluation is modeled after the Pascal DOC. So now we're going to output a list of value box detections with confidences. And detection is considered correct if it's intersection over union with ground truth is greater than some threshold. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of the threshold, but basically the standard is 0.5. Um, but for some of the smaller objects, we're looking a little bit more it's very hard to localize a small object at 0.5 threshold. Um, it's evaluated by average precision per class. And then the winners of the challenge is um, the team that wins the lowest object category. So in every category, we compute the winner, and then overall across the 200, we sort of sum up how many categories the team won, and uh, that's the winner. So it turns out it's actually almost the same. I mean, the ordering doesn't change really if you do um, mean average precision, et cetera. So the top two teams, that actually, uh, it didn't matter. You can use either metric. Um, so I'm going to show some of the results. Um, and usually we would have the teams come up, but this time uh, we're going to save that until the awards uh, ceremony. But we will apply for the winning teams. So object detection results with the, using the provided training data. We have a lot of participants. Um, National University of Singapore won this task. And uh, Microsoft Research Asia Visual Computing Team were the runner-ups. of doing um, additional, of using additional training data. Um, so teams were allowed to um, bring in outside data, and usually most teams brought in the um, image classification data set, which was slightly bigger than detection. Um, and so the winners here was the Google Net team from Google, um, and then the runner-up was the Chinese University of Hong Kong Divide DNet team. We asked, so looking at all these results, you know, you can see it's very impressive, it's 3% between the winning and the second place team. But what does this really mean? I mean 3% if you are looking at one image, I mean, maybe that's not significant, maybe that's just random noise. And so if we um, ask this question, actually, this is one of the things from, um, from our paper. 
Okay, so we were trying to figure out if the differences are statistically significant. Um, and we do this by doing bootstrapping. Um, so for every team, we're able to come up with a confidence interval. And normally we do 95% confidence intervals, but we decided might as well do 99.9 .9 because there's so much data and things seem to be significant even at this level. Um, so again, all the details are in the paper, but we compute the 99.9 for .9 the confidence interval. Um, and so for the uh, winning team, we would uh, data the or, uh, sorry, actually, this is showing all of the teams. So the, the dark ones are um, the, the darker gray background that uses external data, with the lighter gray they don't use external data. That's right. So this is sort of the top few teams. Um, you can see 43 point, um, 43.9 average precision confidence interval around that is about, um, it's 42, 42.9 to 45.7, um, and that's very different than um, the next team, so it's 41. Uh, <laughs> But the second place and the third place team seem to be um, similar. So anyway, there's more analysis in the paper also for all of the um, different tasks. So of course, the question of the day is how much of this is uh, related to the scale of objects and images? So you could say, OK, um, maybe um, some of the object, maybe some of the objects are easier to detect are the ones that appear bigger in the image. So maybe there's sort of Nothing that interesting going on. It's just for the bigger um, for the bigger objects, they, they are easier to detect. So, however, that's actually not the case. And here we're showing on the x-axis the average scale of the object. So, um, if the average fraction of the image area is occupied by an instance of that object class and validation set. Um, so, x-axis is average scale. Y-axis is average precision. So, this is. Basically, of all the teams that competed in 2013 and 2014, what is the highest performance that any of these teams achieved? And each, so each dot corresponds to an object class. And we see an interesting pattern that basically um, performance doesn't really seem to be a function of scale. And it's sort of correlated a little bit, but not really. So for example, um, on the far end, so you have things like sofas and lines, which tend to be very big in the image, but lines are much, much easier to localize than sofas for to detect. Um, and then on the uh, other side, so you have things with very, very low scale, things that are usually very small in the image, so rubber eraser as well as basketball and volleyball, and again, you can see a huge uh, difference in performance there. Um, so this got us thinking, you know, there's something more, um, more fun, uh, there's something different about uh, the different object categories. Um, and again, there's more analysis in the paper, but uh, from here we can just look at some of the easiest and the hardest categories to detect. So the easiest category, the easiest one is butterfly, 93%, probably because it's so colorful and, and uh, the shape is very distinctive. Um, and you sort of see uh, dogs, rabbits, um, the, the mammals, tigers, zebras, with very distinctive um, coloring. And then things like volleyball, also because well, it's small in the image, but it tends to have a distinctive pattern on it, and so on. And then um, if you look at some of the hardest detection categories, and these tend to largely be small man-made objects, so um, also tend to be skinny. So things like flute, like horizontal bars, actual lingo, um, microphone, even, or ski, yeah. Um, things that tend to be uh, very skinny, and, and these are almost, uh, yeah, these are all man-made objects. So there is again more in the paper, but this is all that um, this is all the analysis that we're going to have time to do because I think everybody really wants to hear from the teams and wants to hear about the methods, and uh, we'll talk more about the different analysis later. Um, but for now, we're actually going to move on to presentations from the team. Um, and first up, 